Welcome to Write on Track, formerly known as Readers and Writers. We are still brought to you by the Publishing Club of Laguna Woods, and I'm grateful for their continued support. The change in the title is to signify an expansion of the diversity of people and topics I will introduce on this show in the coming year. I will still cover local authors and their books. However, I will also include other creative endeavors such as art, music, and most important, the art of living the best life possible as we age. It's January, and generally the coldest month of the year in the Northern Hemisphere, even here in sun sunny Southern California. The holidays are behind us, but there are still good reasons to have friends over for dinner. Socializing and social connections improve sleep, well-being, and overall quality of life. If you are stressed or depressed, socializing can help you feel better. Add good food to the mix, and you have a recipe for a great time. Yes, cooking and entertaining seems impossible, or at least incredibly difficult and stressful. Most people find the idea of hosting a party is something to be avoided. To some, it can be more terrifying than an emergency root canal. What kind of a person wants to entertain, plan a party, cook? Well, I know just the person, and that person may be able to help you. My guest today is Nicole Alani, a village resident, French-trained chef, high-end caterer, cookbook author, and a successful life coach for women. She's also done some acting and written a one-woman play that you can see on YouTube, which I understand is a very good play. It was featured in the um, Theater Guild of Laguna Woods as a fundraiser. Nicole's special power is food and elegant entertaining. She has written two wonderful cookbooks on the topic, and these books will help you conquer your fears and amaze your guests. It is my pleasure to introduce La Grande Fromage, Nicole Alian oh, Alani. Welcome, Nicole. Hi, thank you. I, I, love, I love being introduced as La Grande Fromage. <laughs> <laughs> you do the French so well. <laughs> I was worried I wasn't going to do it you well were just enough. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, how old were you when you began planning menus and cooking? Uh, 13. I actually, I opened, I know this sounds crazy, if, if I didn't have people still around who were witnesses, I wouldn't believe it myself, but I, I wanted to make money uh, when I was a little kid, and babysitting didn't seem to be that lucrative, <laughs> and I knew that I could cook, I could always cook, and so when I was 13, I set up a little catering business, uh, I grew up in Laguna Beach, and I delivered menus to all of our neighbors and uh, I charged them, I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think I charged five dollars a night for planning, cooking, serving, and cleaning up. They had to buy the groceries. Oh my! <laughs> you can imagine I sold out, even yes. then. Even then. <laughs> I was booked all summer. Oh, that's great. Um, so obviously I'll, always an entrepreneur. Yes, yes, and you're French trained. Yes, I wound up going to, I went to UCLA as an acting for film major, and then I think ultimately over time I realized it, you know, it was a pretty uh, scary business, you know, Hollywood, mm -hmm. that you couldn't really count on, on making a living as an actor. Yes. And I thought, well, the other, I could always act and I could always cook. And I thought, so I'll go and get a professional culinary education, and then I have a degree, right? And I looked at the, the professional school in the United States, the CIA, which is in upstate New York. And the other school was in Paris. Um, it cost the same. And I was like, upstate New York, Paris. Paris. Upstate New York, <laughs> Paris. Paris. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I saved my money and, and went to cooking school in Paris and mm -hmm. uh, in French, uh -huh. which was you know interesting. I had a lot of French in school, but it's very different when you're 
living in it and having to learn in a second language. Yes, yes, and learn a specific skill too, yeah. not just simply where the bathrooms are. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then your first job. Uh, my first job out of school, and again, I, uh, you know, it's true, hard to believe, but I was hired to be the chef at a chateau um, in Bordeaux um, by one of the wealthiest families in Europe. And they regularly, they used it for symposiums and, you know, educational and artistic retreats. And we typically served 40 people for dinner and, well, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But I was responsible for lunch and dinner. But a big crew. I mean, this was a full-on professional restaurant setup. It just happened to be in a private chateau. Mm -hmm. And you met Julia Child. I did. The, <laughs> the very first day, my first, my first evening that I was producing a meal, um, I was so nervous I was about ready to explode anyway. And the, the madame of the chateau came in at the last minute to say, oh, Nicole, uh, you're American, huh? Uh, so I imagine you know the name Julia Child, huh? I said, yeah, and you know, I just basically wanted her to leave. I'm like, you know, I'm already just drenched in sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, well, uh, she's the guest of honor tonight, huh? Isn't that exciting for you and President Mitterrand? Oh, and my. I, in all honesty, I stepped out into the herb garden and threw up briefly. <laughs> I'm serious. I believe you. It was a complete nervous overwhelm. Yes. And kind of came back in, washed my face and hands, and served the meal. And then Julia Child being the person that she is and was, and she became a friend and a mentor over the years oh, in this like country. Mm -hmm. um, she asked to speak to the chef. She heard it was a young American woman, and she asked to have me come out of the kitchen, which was not done in that kind of very formal, it's a black tie place. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of drug fearfully. I kept saying, no, 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 because I was in a, a dirty apron and sneakers and not. Yes. And this, anyway. That's what, how chefs look. That, right. <laughs> and there, you know, the meal is served by butlers and tails. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a dining room. Yes. And they, she just insisted and everybody, and so I went in and had a sweet little conversation and, mm -hmm. and over the years, she became a, a real a real mentor, a real role model. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And when we spoke earlier, you were also telling me that um, you did a state luncheon for Queen Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. And that was here locally in in Los Angeles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did. I was the director of catering at the Los Angeles Music Center, which at that point in time was the largest catering operation in America. Um, <laughs> which is not a good thing, really. Um, and all of the state occasions for Los Angeles and Southern California were held. It's the, it was the official venue. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot of British royal, a lot of every kind of royalty and all the seated presidents in those years. Um, but I have to say the, the event for Queen Elizabeth was the most fraught. I mean, there were so many people... You know, the, 500, I think. Well, yeah, but I mean, so many people involved in the head of protocol and the State Department and the British ambassador. I mean, like every... So a lot of people to answer to? Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of requirements, mm -hmm. um, a lot of limitations. Mm -hmm. um, it was... It was definitely the most challenging event yeah. I think I ever did. So you told me about peas and onions. Oh. <laughs> so the, as they're explaining to me this long sort of laundry list of do's and don'ts, and I'm like, okay, just tell me what it is, and you know, I'll try to make it work. Among other things, you know, you know, British royalty can. I mean, there's a lot of food limitations. They're allergic to shellfish. The is a blanket statement for the whole British royal family. And there's other things that they avoid. But the one that sort of brought me up short was. They, you know, and you can, you have to serve a meal that can be eaten with only one utensil. Why is and I was that? Like, right, and I was like, what? <laughs> Pardon me? I totally thought I'd misunderstood. And I said, one, one utensil. And they said, yeah, but, I mean, it could be a fork or it could be a spoon. Obviously, the one utensil isn't going to be a knife. But there has to be, we're, we're limiting possibilities for faux pas, right? So we do, you know, the British royalty is not going to be sawing on a steak. You know, something could shoot off the, no peas, they can roll off the plate. So, you know, it was, it was an interesting challenge and to have every bite of the food be locally sourced and produced 
in California uh, was a big deal because it was a state occasion. So, uh, mm-hmm. the, you know, my choices became very narrow. About what yes. we were and it sounds like you did just fine. Yeah, <laughs> it was a great event. Uh-huh. It was actually, and, I, and I'm one of the few people who can tell you what's actually in Queen Elizabeth's purse. No, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then you told me about a grand opening in the city of Rancho Margarita. Yeah, that's wild. I hadn't thought about it until I moved back here to Laguna Woods. And Rancho Santa Margarita is right up at the corner, practically. And my company was hired to do the grand opening of the city of Rancho Santa Margarita before the houses were built. This was a marketing event. And there was like one model home by each of the, I think there were six or seven developers. And they each had a tent uh, adjacent to that. And I, because I'd just done the Olympics right before that when they mm-hmm. were so I catered the VIP portion of the Olympics. And so I was used to transportation, and so I hired the same bus company that had taken people around the Olympic events because we set food up in all seven of these locations, and then people could come, you know, 10,000 people attended this event. And they were bused from location to location, and there was a whole separate meal that at each built. And then there was a final central tent that they wound up in that was the size of a football field mm. where we had desserts and a whole huge live rock and roll concert. And so, but Rancho Sar- Santa Margaret, there was no lake. <laughs> there were no, there were seven <laughs> model homes and a bunch of tents. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, was, it was definitely the biggest event. We were... They, they built a tent for us to cook in on site because this was so huge. Mm-hmm. And I was there with a crew of 30 or 40 chefs in trucks and trucks and refrigerators and tents for a week there on site prepping all of this. My, my, my. So you were supervising all these people. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so you had to envision this whole event in terms of the food. Oh, 100%. I mean, and that, you know, catering at that level becomes more like being a general in the army. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had the job because I was a chef, and yeah, we, you know, I planned the recipes and the menu and stuff, but that's a, that's a battle plan. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's making that food by themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you 30 guys over there are on the roast beef. You 20 people over here, make sure the chicken turns out, mm-hmm. right? Yes, yes. So that's my memories of Rancho Santa Margarita. Wow. Well, I will bring you down to more what will be helpful to our audience. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you said in terms of creating an event for a smaller number of people. Yes, which of course is what we're all doing. (laughs) Yes, is do what you do the best and buy the rest. Amen, yes, Uh hello, I can't underscore this enough. People think that um, you're supposed to um, prepare every bite of everything you serve or you're not really successful, you're not a really good entertainer. And I I attribute this to Martha Stewart's influence over the years, frankly. But what every good caterer does, um, and I was one and lots of my friends are too, is you do what you do a really good job at. And if, let's say in your case, if what you do really well is lasagna or pigs in a blanket, Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And you know that you can turn that out without stress, that it comes out great every time, your friends all really like it. It could be Caesar salad. Um, You focus on that, because the big clue for making entertaining something you're going to do more than once every five years, Mm -hmm. which is the point, as you say, it's good for our health, it's good for our mental health, it's good good in every way to have socialization. It is. Is to do things, to set your goals for something you know you're going to be able to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So I also, I was telling you, I'm having some people over on Friday, and I finished the main dish this morning put it in the freezer, because I don't want to have to mess with it. I want to be able to take this out and bake it and just spend the time the day of my party, you know, setting the table and opening wine or whatever, and so that I can be fully present with my guests, Mm because that's the fun. This is not a show. This is not a job. Yes, yes. This is, so what's fun for you? What do you, do you enjoy baking? You know, Mm -hmm. maybe you just make the dessert and you order, you know, a nice Italian meal from one of the places in the neighborhood. Makes sense. Makes what sense. do you like to make? What do I like to make? Um, well, I'd say the thing I make best is barbecue ribs. 
Woo, well, <laughs> always a winner, always yeah. a hit, Yes. right? Always the center of a meal, but then mm -hmm. you could buy everything that went with it. Mm -hmm. you, yes. could, you could buy great coleslaw, you could buy great, you know, barbecued beans, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, whatever you thought went with it. Yes. yes. And people are gonna, and the, at the end of the day, if you're relaxed and you're having a good time, people's perception is this was a successful party. Yes. Yes. And if you're in the kitchen and they don't see you all night, uh, no. or you're wringing your hands and going, oh God, you know, is this no, coming no, out? No, oh my no, God, no. it's burning. Oh, should I put it in? Should I take it out? They're not having fun either. Yes. Yes. No, absolutely. Um, you mentioned also a story w which maybe you'd be willing to share about Martha Stewart's Thanksgiving. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so this, this is, this is actually, yeah, this is actually quoted in my play because it was such an extraordinary experience for me. I saw a, a Martha Stewart television show, and I'm sure this was 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a long time ago, and it was her Thanksgiving special. And she started her Thanksgiving preparations with an egg, a turkey egg, which she then, ha you know, hatched and fed and grew and then butchered herself with her brother's help, as I recall, then plucked the feathers, which she then made into a pillow for someone oh, no. to say, I am not making this up. <laughs> and I know that there was thousands of people, who knows, millions of people who watched this show and other things like Martha Stewart kind of entertainers presented and thought if they were, you know, not doing every bite of everything like this, that they were a loser, mm -hmm. that they were not good at entertaining, that they weren't doing it right. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I sort of made it my mission to... You know, I used to teach a lot and do a lot of presentations about cooking, and it was like, so do what you do best means literally find the place where you're happy. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a recipe of your mother's. I yes. don't know. It certainly wouldn't be slaughtering a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, come on, it's not starting with the egg either. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> right, I mean, for me, if I had to slaughter the turkey, the meal would be over. Yes. You know, the, none of it would be out. I would have named the turkey, and yeah, it would be my right. friend. <laughs> right, the attending the guest. Yes, the right. Table, right. <laughs> yes, yes. So where do you get your recipes from? That's a really good question. This is funny, I've been interviewed so many times. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. Um, I, if I, I come up with an idea, so I mean, I've had, to, I, I've had jobs where I've had to write. I've done a lot of freelance food writing besides my books. And mm -hmm. so I have a spreadsheet of probably 2,500 original recipes that, thank heavens, I had an assistant who sorted all this and keywords so you can search chicken or healthy oh, or summer oh, or, oh, yeah. Makes sense. But, Mostly I start with an idea. I'd like to have something that's light and healthy and it has apricots in it and it's, you can do it ahead of time and the entree, the protein is chicken. Mm -hmm. And then if I don't already have something like that, I'll start looking online. Mm -hmm. And you know, like everybody now, right, um, I presume. And I'll look and I'll see, so, oh, look, this person, they braised it. This person was fire roasting it first. This person used dried apricots. This, you know, and I'll start, and this is how every recipe in all, there are no absolutely original recipes. Yes. This is for thousands of years. We've yes. all been, I have, you know, or I have something in a restaurant mm -hmm. that I love, and I'm pretty much capable of, Exactly, duplicating Yeah, that. deconstructing but Yeah, it. but that's not my recipe. Mm -hmm. I'm copying something I had mm -hmm. and then, you know, writing it up so maybe somebody else could also make it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, don't ever feel shy about, you know, using somebody else's recipe. Um, you know, find cookbooks that you love. You'll find certain books or certain mm -hmm. websites, certain, you know, podcasts that you you can tell you really like this person's palate, the stuff, the spices they use, and I mean, I'm really concerned about healthful eating and cooking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are websites or authors where everything is so fried and so over-seasoned and that um, I just, it's probably delicious, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, but I just know I'm not gonna make it. Yes, yes. And so there are, um, and now there's so many, um, so many podcasts that have got great recipes, but. Well, and to change the focus a little bit, you have a somewhat of a, um, um, 
a sad story, at least the beginning of a sad story, and then a kind of a happy ending. And that was the death of your husband 25 years ago, approximately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big changing point in your life for many reasons. Would you share that story? Sure. I mean, that's really, um, I mean, clearly it was, it was the hardest time in my life. He was diagnosed with a terminal illness, and they told us how long he had to live. And in fact, he, that's, he lived that time. Um, but I, I wrote my play, which is called Le Grand Fromage, so thank oh. you for that. And you can find it on YouTube. Um, because so many people over the years had said that what I went through was so scary to them to even witness. Mm -hmm. Because I, when I was, the short story, because we don't have too much time, <laughs> is when I was 50 years old, I wound up with no home, no job, no career. And no husband. No, no husband, no stability, no safety net, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I was 50, so I had basically to sell our home and get out in just you know a very brief time after his funeral. And, and I lived in Laguna Beach at that time. And like many people would think, you know, it's hopeless. At 50, I'm gonna start a whole new career and a whole new life, I have nowhere to live, I have no, I have no nothing. Mm. I had a car and a big dog and a cell phone and a laptop mm. and some clothes, mm -hmm. and I was 50. And um, I thought it was hopeless, you know, but I had, to, you, you know, Necessity is the mother, right? Yes. Um, and a friend gave me a gift certificate for life coaching because nobody knew what else to do to help me. Mm -hmm. And I tried that, and which is ultimately why I became a life coach many years later. And that person and that experience is how I know that this saved my life. I mean, I was not physically ill, but... No, but I understand. I and understand. I ultimately, through, through working with her... Mm -hmm. I know this is very, sounds like a very eccentric solution, but I thought, well, the answer to this is I'll just write a book, which is not very practical. <laughs> but I was very lucky, and it worked, and I would never have had the strength or the focus to complete this without it. The, the final manuscript was due a month after my husband's funeral, and I just, I, I, I called her and said, I can't do it, I'm out, I'm done, I guess I'll have to send back my advance, this is, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And she had sort of an intervention with me <laughs> and basically just read me the riot act about your husband is dying mm -hmm. and you're not. Mm -hmm. So once he's gone, if you haven't written this book, you're really going to be in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. You need it. And, and she basically just, you know, had me pinned to the wall. Reality contact. Yes, <laughs> but like large. Yes. Written, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, she said, your husband's, and I thought, well, this is so rude, you know. But, she, <laughs> but of course it was true. Yes, it was. And so that became the beginning of creating a new life as a food writer and a food instructor and a food mm. spokesperson and then more books came from that. Yes. So you never know. Yes. You do not know. You just have to be in action headed in the right direction. You have to yes. take some energetic action. Yes, on your own and behalf. keep moving because- Keep if, moving. Yes, if you just stop, then the world is gonna move past you anyway. Right, and that is maybe the biggest thing. I mean, I say this to my coaching clients all the time. Um, you, you aim at a target, and I thought, and this is so incredibly naive, and, and yet I'm willing to say it publicly. I thought for sure that when the book came out, I'd get a show on the Food Network, and my career would be handled for the rest of my life because I'd be well known, and everybody would have read my book, and everything would just be all swell. Uh huh. <laughs> and guess what? None of those things happened, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But other things happened. Yes. That I couldn't have known about. Yes. Opportunities that I'd never even heard of mm -hmm. came to me because I'd written a book. People saw the book and said, well, would you like to be a spokesperson for our product? Or would you like to teach on a cruise ship in the Nile, you know, in the Mediterranean? <laughs> the cruise ship on the Nile is my per per present fantasy, actually. Uh. Um, and so you can't know what's going to happen. All you can know is if you're reaching in the right direction, mm -hmm. chances are good. Yes. And, and it's, it all worked for a whole new world. 
Yes, opens was, up. Mm -hmm. And a saying I have is, take a step on the path, and the path shall appear. Yes. Yay. Mm -hmm. We seem to have the clearly the same <laughs> fellow. Yes. That's the exact truth. Yes. And, and that's really the <clears throat> why I went ahead and went to the really ex extensive trouble to write a play, which took me like five years. It's very oh hard. My. It's a lot harder than you think. It's a 90 woman, 90 minute one woman show. So I'm on stage cooking the whole time in a real live kitchen set while delivering a 90 minute monologue about my life story. Oh. It was hard. I look forward to, to seeing it, yes. <laughs> um, but I did it because so many people had told me over and over that other women needed to see someone who at 50 had the, you know, everything ripped out from under them and who found a way to go on. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just go on, I have a nice life. Yes, yes. I live in Laguna Woods, hey? Yes, that's right. <laughs> As I say to my clients, I live indoors. You know? <laughs> it's all good. And, well, I have running water and... <laughs> and something I'd like to add is, for, for those of the, our audience who are afraid to try to cook uh, for a group or to put together some kind of an event, it's a creative act, and your life is a creative act. Living every day, the choices you make are creative acts, and cooking is no different. Beautiful. And you can really embrace that and, uh, and have fun doing it. Well, and, and, and the, the Buddhist in me is, and don't get too attached to the outcome. Yes, yes. So if you, so that's, you know, creativity is killed. If you're attached to, I'm going to paint this picture, and when it's done, it's going to be a Monet. Mm -hmm. And so then you're so weighted down with your expectations of how perfect or excellent or fabulous something has to be. It's, it's really the process, and it's also for entertaining. And then it's the process of, even if you screw it up, to, uh, sharing that transparent. I had somebody over to dinner recently here, mm -hmm. and for the first time in my life, because I can't get used to these electric stove <laughs> yes. I can't, no, really. A lifetime cooking on gas? Yes. This is a learning. I burned, I mean, I've never burned anything in my whole, since I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at my, thank God it was a lovely woman. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> wow, this is actually burned. I mean, mm -hmm. like, burn <laughs> like are you willing to eat this because it's at that level uh -huh. how hungry are you yes and she said well let's try <laughs> but you know it that's still a social experience yes it she is. probably feels closer to me now i'm gonna guess because i don't seem like some intimidating chefy person i screwed it up just like she could and yes we yes. had a funny time we had mm -hmm. an extra glass of wine yes yes <laughs> and we want to support each other yes. in our adventures whether they succeed or fail yeah Beautiful. Yes, yes. Oh, very, very good. So I just have one more question for you, and that's uh, if you were going to throw a, a party, I mean, for like, let's say, six people mm -hmm. in January, mm -hmm. what theme would you pick? Oh, a theme for January? Well, January to me is always about regeneration, you know, sort of, and beginnings. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that can, you know, what whatever indicates, it's also a hopeful time. Mm-hmm to me? Yes. Um, I do my review at the beginning of January with where am I at with my value. I mean, I don't, you know, set a list of what I must do, but I don't associate particular, f I mean, obviously it needs, to me, it, food always needs to be really seasonal and local. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got root vegetables and maybe it's a heartier meal and maybe it's something like a, a really rich stew, which again, perfect entertaining dish, whether it's lamb or beef, mm -hmm. you've made it ahead of time. And those kind of recipes are actually better if they're made ahead of time and either frozen or reheated. Ah. You want to build a toolkit or a little toolbox of those recipes that are better if they're made ahead of time mm -hmm. and either frozen or reheated. Got it. Right. You only need to have three or four things that you're great at. Mm -hmm. Really, yes. to, have a, to be a really <laughs> successful entertainer. Uh, that makes so sense. So you've got ribs. Yep. Okay, they're always good in January. Yes. They're good in the summer. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. This is just wonderful, and I love your cookbooks. Thank you so much. I have not been able to even grasp all the depth of information oh, in them, thanks. from entertaining and catering and hiring people and recipes I Just, tried. I mean, that it was, was apparent. And the artwork is also very good. He's a wonderful, wonderful sort of world famous cartoonist. I was lucky enough to. Mm -hmm. He does lots of cartoons and 
The New Yorker and New York Times and Women's Word. And yeah, he's, yes. yeah, Gary Hovland. Yes, very good. Well, so this concludes another episode of our new show name, Right on Track. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for viewing. And as you know, we're on Monday at 10.30 a.m. Yeah, and Thursdays at 4.30. Um, and hope to hear that you've had a good time here. Reach out to me, please, uh, through the Pub Club website. And uh, have a wonderful January. Thank you. Mm -hmm.